In 1801, the Russian Empire annexed the Georgian Kingdom and thus ended a long history of Georgia's independence. This was followed by a heavy-handed imperial regime because Georgia was a buffer zone between the constantly warring um, Ottoman and Russian empires. Everything changed in 1844 when the, uh, the imperial regime was relaxed and uh, Caucasian vice royalty introduced. Since then, Georgia as a phenomenon was maintained mostly by its culture. In the first decades of the new century, Georgia was living a dynamic political life. Mensheviks, Bolsheviks, liberals, social revolutionaries, anarchists, conservatives were struggling to win the hearts and minds of the Georgians. Eventually the Mensheviks, led by the charismatic Noe Jordania, turned out to be the most successful. They soon managed to drive out the Bolsheviks and become the de facto ruling party in Georgia. When the Russian Revolution took place in 1917, the Russian rule in Caucasia was already nominal. In spring 1917, the Viceroy fled the Caucasus and Georgia was suddenly in the hands of the political parties. In fall 1917, the first National Assembly was elected and presided by Noe Jordania. The First World War was a catalyst for Georgia's independence. Soon after it started, the Ottoman Empire annexed uh, the bigger part of southwestern Georgia. In order to secure uh, its territorial integrity, Georgia and other Caucasian republics have to unite and form an odd political entity called the Transcaucasian Democratic Federation. On 26 May 1918, in the former residence of the Russian Viceroy, Georgia's independence was announced. In the two and a half years of independence, much was achieved. Tbilisi State University, the first university in the Caucasus, was founded. A daring agricultural and administrative reform was initiated. Writers, poets, artists, musicians, academics found a new momentum for their work in the celebration of the impossible independence. All the symbols and institutions of statehood were formed. The tricolor flag, the coat of arms and the anthem were adopted and a multi-ethnic, multi-party constituent assembly, which included five women, was created, which managed to pass some of the most progressive laws of the era. Finally, in February 1921, a progressive constitution was adopted, which guaranteed human rights, especially those of the ethnic minorities, women and other groups who were never before represented in the Georgian body politic. In addition, Georgia was also declared an explicitly secular state. The greatest challenge for the young republic was international recognition and the post-war balance of power. Georgia's independence was challenged both by the White and the Red Army and the Russian Civil War. And when the Bolshevik victory became imminent, Georgians rushed to find international support against them. Many foreign delegations visited the new republic. However, the initially pro-Georgian Social Democrats found it increasingly hard to find recognition in the new order. After a tremendous effort of Georgian diplomats, first de facto and then officially, the Allies recognized Georgia's independence. Despite this international recognition, four days after the constitution was adopted, on 25 February, the Bolsheviks marched into Tbilisi. The pretext, as usual, for Georgia's occupation was the support for the local Bolsheviks, who were allegedly suffering under the Menshevik regime. In the next couple of years, Stalin and the Bolsheviks terminated the Republic, exiled its leaders, wiped out its institutions and exterminated its intellectual elites. A desperate insurrection followed in 1924, which ended in even further repressions and killing. Although for nearly 30 years Georgians have been celebrating their independence of 26 May 1918, the story of Georgia's independence and the Democratic Republic is only now being told. The collapse of Russian Empire in 1917 brought not only independence to Georgia, but marked the coming of artistic modernism and modernist avant-garde. In late 1910s and early 1920s, Tbilisi, or Tiflis, as the city would call the time, turned into a center attracting many poets and artists trying to escape Russian civil war, seeking warmth, peace, 
good food and wine. Many Russians coming from the devastated cities, devastated by the civil war, when they would see the electric lights in the streets, they would kiss the land and pray to the lampposts. Those included greats I mean, of Russian Silver Age, like Nikolai Gumilov, Vladimir Mayakovsky, a poet and dramatist who was born in Georgia, Osip Mandelstam, Boris Pasternak, Alexei Kruchonich, and many, many others. Tiflis has always been a multi-ethnic place, but uh, it had never seen such a diversity and influx of creative individuals who spoke all languages. They even spoke some poetic shibboleth, transmentalism invented by Russian futurists, and even Esperanto. So by the time of the First Republic, Tiflis turned into a vibrant modernist city. And all the foreigners, the artists, the poets, were greeted and embraced by Georgian poets and artists who forged Georgian modernism and Georgian avant-garde. Modernism comes from the cafe culture. In late 1910s and early 1920s, several artistic cafes emerged in Tiflis, and most of them were located on this avenue, the main avenue of the city called Golovin Avenue, now it's called Rustaveli. Out of these cafes, the four of them used to be most popular. Those were uh, Yuri Degen's Fantastic Tavern, the Argonauts' Boat, the Peacock Tail, and Kimerioni. Now we are at what used to be called uh, Kimerioni, the major cafe, artistic cafe of Tbilisi, founded in 1919. Currently it's the lobby of the Georgia's major dramatic theatre, Rustaveli Theatre. The name Kimerioni comes from the ancient Greek mythic creature Chimera. We can still see some of the murals left on the walls. These paintings are by the Russian artist Sergei Sudeikin and the Georgian artists Lado Gudiashvili, David Kakabadze, and others. Here you can see the wall painting by Lado Gudiashvili. It's called the Stepkos Tavern. These cafes were not just places for booze and eating. Those were the places of education and knowledge. The poets and artists would hold presentations here, lectures, exhibitions, musical and theatrical performances. And of course, of course, they would also drink and smoke down much. Sudeikin's wife, Vera Sudeikina, is of special mention. She was the queen of this place. She was the muse and inspiration to Georgian poets. By the way, soon she'll divorce her husband, Sudeikin, and marry her old love, Igor Stravinsky, and stay with him until their death. The Fellowship of the Blue Horns was the most influential among uh, Georgian modernists. And uh, uh, it was made up of uh, such poets as Paolo Yashvili, Tizian Tabidze, Ukolao Nadiradze, Valerian Gaprindashvili, and the intellectual guru Grigol Robakidze. They all came, actually, they all came from the western Georgian city of Kutaisi. This is the second largest city of Georgia still. And we can say that the roots of Georgian modernism are there. Blue Horn people, they drew their inspiration from French and Russian symbolists, from Oscar Wilde, from Friedrich Nietzsche, who was very influential for them, Edgar Poe, from Filippo Marinetti, from Italian Commedia dell'arte, but also they drew their inspiration from Georgian paganism, Georgian mythology, the poetry of Vajab Shavela, the great pre-modernist poet who died in 1915, and the paintings of Nico Pirosmanishvili, or Nico Pirosmani, the self-taught primitive artist who would uh, decorate and paint uh, Tbilisi taverns and small restaurants, and uh, who then eventually became the major figure in the National Gallery, the painter of mere being, as I call him. 
These poets had the close association with the Georgian artists and painters who forged Georgian modernist avant-garde. Those were David Kakabadze, Ladogu Diashvili, Eleni Akhlediani, Shalvaki Kodze, Valerian Sidamon Eristavi, Petre Otscheli, and Zdanevich brothers, Ilya and Kirill. They were half Polish, half Georgian. They were excellent painters. They were amazing book designers, stage designers, and writers. They came up with the concept of everythingness, or orchestral style, saying that every style is acceptable and good for uh, expressing your artistic vision. Add to them the reformers of Georgian theater, Konstantin Marjanishvili, Sandro Ahmetaeli, the filmmaker Mikhail Kalatozov, and you'll get the broad picture of Georgian modernism. Kimerioni was the site where Georgian symbolists and Cuba futurists and Dadaists would clash. I can see some episodes still, they come like chimeras to me. I can see Paolo Yashvili and Tizian Tabidze, their Russian friends, reciting their poems, stating their artistic vision. And uh, I can see Grigoro Bakidze sitting in the corner, surrounded by young students, and he's uncovering to them the mysteries of modern art and Weltanschauung, while the futurists will show up with herrings instead of their ties, producing stench, and producing even worse stench by burning sulfur in the bowls and walking among the tables. Suddenly, one of the futurists, Nogol Chachawa, stealing at Grigoro Bakidze, snatches the wig from the head of the guru and starts running with this wig around the tables like a savage headhunter and wrapping his Dadaist poem. This mansion, downtown Tbilisi, was built by famous Georgian manufacturer, philanthropist and the patron of arts, David Sarajishvili, who then sold this house to another Georgian businessman and philanthropist, Akaki Khoshtaria, who in turn, at the advent of the Bolsheviks, gave this house to the Georgian writers. Georgian writers enjoyed their modernist existence in this house for nearly a decade. But then Stalin came to power and uh, socialist realism was imposed on them from above. Thus, the good old artistic modernist life of Tiflis ended. For some it ended literally, while the others donned the gowns of the high priests of uh, proletarian literature. Tizian Tabize, novelist Mikhail Javakishvili, Theatre director Sandro Ahmeteli, amazing theatre designer and artist Petre Oskheli, conductor Evgeny Mikheladze, those were executed in 1937 during the Great Purge. Grigoro Bakidze fled for Germany earlier, stayed there and wrote in German. In the same year of 1937, Paolo Yashvili, after a conversation with Laurenti Beria, the then boss of Bolshevik Georgian government and the future maker of KGB, he came back to this house, went upstairs to his room and shot himself dead. Meanwhile, the session of the Writers' Union of Georgia was underway, sharply criticizing his artistic and political views. Pirosmani was uh, born in Georgia. Uh, he was from the very poor farmer's family, and but he was living near the famous old Christian church, where he, of course, studied some Christian icon painting. The Georgian frescoes are brilliant and architecture, of course, 
of medieval times. When he came into Pilisi, he used this knowledge. and began to paint these tavernas. For him, it was like walls of church. Uh, and uh, when uh, the radical avant-gardists, like Russian-French artists, Ledantu and their and his friends, brothers Danevich, found Pirosmani, this poor painter. They were astonished. He was discovered in 1912 in the tower Mariagi, near railway station. He was discovered by the Tbilisi and Russian avant-garde. The reason why his art is so interesting is not uh, that he's like French Rousseau, uh, primitive artist. No, he's coming from old Christian art. And uh, in time of uh, avant-garde, when oldest times meet, uh, new time when artists begin to destroy uh, deformation uh, uh, the objects and pictures uh, when old art meets new Pirosmani with his old Christian tradition became uh, like El Greco for uh, Spain and Italy. Art was forbidden in the 30s. Many artists at first time worked in theaters and uh, worked for uh, filmmakers. And uh, it was beautiful uh, time for uh, these films. Uh, but uh, after the Second War, uh, they also, it was uh, banned and it was impossible to work even in theater uh, after 40s. Even when I was student in Art Academy in 70s, Everything after Impressionism was banned. At that time, I paint pictures of old families, from old family photos, which were also forbidden in Soviet Union. There were priests, officers, nobility, farmers, and all these people were banned and killed, and even photos, it was dangerous to show. It was impossible to show my works. I call this concept uh, destroyed aristocracy, because Georgian ethos was aristocratic and this was banned uh, very much. The antique history of Georgians the titles of their kings and the photos of aristocracy. So it was for me like uh, new icons and because Christian art was forbidden. After 90s, a curator from Switzerland, Daniel Baumann, organized together with my friends and me first exhibitions of Georgian modernism and avant-garde in New York, Gessi Kaplan Gallery, and in Kunsthalle in Zurich. And I hope that in 21st century uh, the world will discover again uh, the Georgian culture and Georgian avant-garde.